Today's speaker is uh, Feng Chen, and yeah, he is here at the HAO, and he's studied uh, astronomy and astrophysics in Nanjing University in China uh, for his undergraduate, and then in 2012 he did his he started his PhD at Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research, working with Harley Peter, um, and there he used MHD simulations to study formation and heating of the solar corona during magnetic flux emergence. And he, de he defended his thesis at the University of Göttingen in 2015. And after that, he joined HAO as an ASP postdoc uh, this past January, where he's working with uh, Matthias Rempel and Yuhong Feng on flux emergence from solar convection zone to the corona. And he will talk today on the formation of solar active regions and their corona through magnetic flux emergence. Hello everyone, I will be talking about the emergence of magnetic field from the solar convection zone to the corona and then the formation of the active region and the active region corona during the flux emergence today. So here is a very, very, very brief, uh, this, uh, very brief uh, review on the life of a magnetic field in the sun. So we believe that there is a dynamo inside the sun, so mostly in the convection zone, uh, that generates and intensifies the magnetic field. And the magnetic field generated in, inside the sun will emerge through the convection zone and finally reach the surface of the sun, which is typically we call a photosphere. And the, there are regions with, the, with this emerged strong magnetic field. So this is known as active regions, and in particular, when the magnetic field is strong enough to suppress the convective motion at the surface of the sun, so it forms a sunspot which appears as a dark spot compared to the ambient photosphere. So the magnetic field will definitely not stop at the surface of the sun, it will further expand to the atmosphere of the sun and finally uh, reach the corona and we believe that the magnetic field is very important in everything we see in the corona from the very basic corona structures such as corona loop to all kinds of activities of the sound such as flares and CMEs and just to, this is because uh, the magnetic energy in the corona totally dominates over everything else because the plasma energy has simply is so low compared to the magnetic energy so given that the magnetic field is so important for the sound, uh, so what do we know about the magnetic field from observation? Because when I study astronomy, I was told that astronomy, if solar physics is still in, uh, inside astronomy, astronomy is driven by observations. So what is the, what is the observations we have for magnetic field? Unfortunately, in the convection zone, there's no observations. And in the corona, I must not say no here because the people in HAO did a very good job on marrying the magnetic field of the corona. But this is only available with coronagraph. That means we can only mirror those off the off the solar disk. And even though, and, and even even this is uh, contaminated by the line of sight integration, and there's no hope basically as far as I know, to measure the magnetic field in a corona on the solar disk. Uh, life is easier in the photosphere. We have a very good measurement of vector magnetic field in the photosphere, even though this relies on some kind of inversion of the Stox parameters in the photosphere. So it seems direct observation of the, uh, of the magnetic field in the sun is pretty difficult. So the hope is that we can use numerical simulations to improve our understanding of the magnetic field. And I would like to refer a particular kind of simulation that is realistic simulations. So even though the observation of magnetic field is so limited, but we still have many other kinds of observations for the sound, such as here this is the image of the sunspot, and this is the EUA image of the corona, uh, captured by SUAI. So in order to understand these observations, we want to build a model that is comparable with these actual observations. So this requires that the model must include the most important ingredient 
that is uh, essential to get the right thermodynamics in this model. So for the upper convection zone and the photosphere, this refers to the rigidity transfer, for example, equation of state that considers the partial ionization of the plasma. And you, have, you must have a right stratification of the convection zone and properly consider the compressibility of the gas there. And for the solar atmosphere, in particular the corona, so we must include optically thin radiation and uh, high temperature dependent and anisotropic heat conduction along magnetic field lines. And also the crucial thing is the heating of the corona, which is still a hypothesis so far. And we must also have a sunlight atmosphere for the model. So actually this model has been quite uh, successful to, to, to create synthesized observations that looks almost identical to, to the actual observation. So ideally what we want to have is uh, overall comprehensive model that includes everything and does everything in one fully self-consistently but such a realistic model is so far unrealistic to do. So that is why usually we decouple these models into two well categories. So the, this, this one usually considers the coupling between the solar convection zone and the solar photosphere. And this kind of model usually considers the coupling between the solar surface, so say the solar photosphere, and the, the upper atmosphere, so to so say the corona. So, so this leads to the coupling simulation I want to present today. The first one is the emergence of the magnetic flux generated from the com uh, in a convective dynamo. So, so we have known that this simul this realistic simulations have been very successful in the past, but one thing seems to be missing so far. So even though this process has been treated very realistically, but we haven't, we don't know what the solar dynamo is actually doing. And in the past, in the, in the previous models, usually people implement a very idealized magnetic field. It, they are either directly imposed in the domain or a very uh, idealized uh, flux tube is advected through the bottom of the domain for flux emergence studies. So, and, and by, by doing this, we also lose the fully self-consistentness the self of the velocity field and magnetic field. So what we want to improve is we actually use a solar convective dynamo simulation as a source of the magnetic field for, magnetic, for, for the emergence of the flux. So the simulation we use is down here by Yu Hong and Fang Fang. So it has very good features because it's that it has a solar like convection and differential rotation. And more importantly, there is the emerging flux generated self consistently in this model. That means if we take the velocity and magnitude from this simulation, we get a fully self consistent dynamic evolution of, the, of these two fields, which you cannot do. If by, by, by more idealized setups. Then the limit of, uh, of this convective dynamo simulation is that they usually use analytic assumptions, which is not valid near the surface of the sound. So that is why we need to couple this simulation with a, uh, with a flux emergence simulation that can do the upper convection zone and solar photosphere realistically. So, so this is how we couple these two simulations. So this actually shows the emerging flux in this convective dynamo simulation. And what we do is that we follow a reading that is centered by this emerging flux tube, and then extract the velocity and magnetic field in a horizontal layer. Uh, so, so this gives us a description of the convective motions and the magnetic field. But these two simulation cannot be simply cannot be connected simply. So we need to do some rescaling on the data that includes to rescale the vertical velocity so it can match the average convective velocity of the flux flux emergence simulation. 
and we also need to rescale the very large domain of the collective dynamo simulation to a domain that is doable in the flux emergence simulation. So for the flux emergence simulation, we use the Muran code, which, is, which should be familiar to people here. So it is known to do very realistic simulation in the upper convection zone and solar photosphere because it includes these key features. And what we do is that, uh, so the, the domain size of the flux emergence simulation is typically about 100 megameters wide and 8 megameters deep. We also, we, we have several other cases that extend the domain to 200 megameters wide and up to 30 megameters depth. Then the resolution is amazingly low, I would say in this way, because this is the uh, lowest resolution we can use to still resolve the granulation. This must have thanks to the very low numerical diffusivity in Muram code. And the initial condition we use is a fully relaxed magnetoconvection. There is a small scale mixed polarity magnetic field in the domain that is maintained by the uh, local dynamo. Uh, so yeah, so something I, I I didn't emphasize is that we actually get this gets the velocity and the magnetic field in this in this horizontal layer and put it at the bottom boundary of the flux emergence simulation and we update the bottom boundary values with time. So this is a time dependent bottom boundary that drives the flux emergence simulation. So and this. Do you also use um, density and, and pressure and temperature? No, we don't use density and temperature. So the density and temperature is set by the Murram code, so to say. Yeah. If we had 98 by 98, what did that mean? Oh, sorry. The, the, the dimensions. You had dimensions? On the previous slide, you had 98 by 98, and then in brackets, 100. Well, so that means for some of the setups, we, we have a. 100 megameter wide box, oh. and for some other test cases, we we also have two, we also What's have larger boxes. What's the size of the grid? The grid is 192 kilometers. But how many? The number of grid points is typically 512 for this case and 1k for this case. So sorry, just to clarify that. So you the density and in, in, in pressure you get from 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 Muram, but when these things come in, are they buoyant? Do they have any de density deficit inside the two? Uh, so the so the density in the flux tube is set by this. Uh, the entropy of the emer the entropy inside the emerging flux region is controlled by a certain fixed value, and then the pressure is extrapolated from the box. And uh, finally, the density is defined by the equation of state through the entropy and pressure. But the magnetic field doesn't feature into that, so it's probably it's probably less dense than than its surroundings, just because it's in an upflow, but not not um, pressure per per Magnetic pressure perturbations are considered okay. at the bottom boundary. I mean, there is a pre the pressure is not uniform. There is a pressure perturbation allowed. So if in the box because of magnetic fields, the pressure is lower than that is also translated into the ghost cells. So yeah. the code allows for pressure perturbation. So there can be magnetic buoyancy in that sense. Yeah, but the buoyancy should not be the most important thing for the emergence of this flux field because we have imposed the outflow with the magnetic field. So this is what we get after 30 hours of evolution. So these two panels show the vertical, I'll say the line of sight magnetic field at the tau equals to one layer, the optical depth equals to one layer, which is considered as a photosphere. And this one shows the continuum intensity at the photosphere. And these two panels show, show the bottom boundary. This one is the horizontal magnetic field. So you can see the, the horizontal flux tube at the center of the domain. And this one shows the vertical velocity, so you can see the the horizontal flux tube is emerged with the outflow. So blue here is up, and then the the flux tube is actually embedded in a giant convection cell. So this is the outflow. So this is the downdraft around the a giant convection cell. 
So if we check the evolution of the, 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 of the simulation, so at the beginning, you only see the, the, the small scale magnitude, flat magnitude imagined by a small scale dynamo. Uh, then you have the, a pair of sunspots forming in the southern hemisphere. But what we really focus is, that is on the, is on the sun's bear in the center. So you see that uh, the sunspot forms through the coalescent of small scale flux which is consistent with what people found in previous flux emergence simulations. And then the sunspots grow from a small pore into a a dark sunspot that is surrounded by fundamentary penumbra structures. So now here, the so both sunspots in the uh, in the in this pair has formed. So if we break down the evolution into three stages, so in the first stage, the leading sunspot appears as a small pore uh, in the magnetogram, also in the continuum intensity. At the same time, the, the following sunspot it doesn't really create any kind of visible structure, either in the continuum intensity or the magnetogram. There is only some small scale of magnetic flux. And after seven hours, the leading the sunspot in the leading polarity has become a well defined sunspot with a very dark amber and surrounded amber with strong magnetic field and uh, surrounded by sedimentary penumbra structures, and still at this moment, the following polarity spot is only a few small pores. Also, the magnetic field strength is much weaker. So only after another 7 hours, 7.5 hours, so the following polarity field has become a well-defined sunspot that is similar to the uh, leading polarity uh, sunspot. So, so this is known as the asymmetry of the sunspot pair. That means the leading polarity sunspot is stronger and more coherent than the following polarity sunspot. And also, the sunspot pair actually makes an inclined, uh, makes an angle to the equator because the leading polarity sunspot is more close to the equator. So in this simulation, the equator is about at this place. So, so this, this is actually in the southern hemisphere, and this is in the northern hemisphere. So another thing that we found in this figure is that if we, oops, if we compare the position of the sunspot in the photosphere and the vertical velocity field at the bottom, we found that the sunspot is always so the position of the sunspot in the photosphere is actually consistent with the strongest downdraft length at the bottom boundary. So which means the bottom boundary actually controls what we see in the photosphere. So in order to answer the origin of the asymmetry we find in the photosphere, we must go to the bottom. So here is a, deep, is a zoom to the vertical velocity and horizontal magnetic field strength at the photosphere in a region that is across the central uh, flux tube. So we can see that uh, the, the flux tube emerging at the bottom boundary actually suddenly stopped at, uh, at the strongest uh, downdraft length uh, of the giant convex, convection cell it embedded in. So this plot shows, that, shows the relation between the vertical magnetic field and the vertical velocity field. So the strong vertical magnetic field is actually the foot point of the sunspot we see in the photosphere. So that is, the, that is its foot point at the bottom boundary. And then this shows, so this, then this shows the, the downdraft length. We can see a clear relation between the strongest uh, vertical magnetic field and the strongest uh, uh, downflows. Down down so this means the, the appearance, uh, also the, the the sunspot in the photosphere is actually controlled, it, in particular its position and strength, it's controlled by the downdraft length at the bottom because the downdraft length at the bottom is stronger on the leading side compared to that in the, in the following side. 
So the leading spot is stronger than the following spot. So because we adopt this data from the, the convective dynamo simulation, so finally we still need to go back to the convective dynamo simulation to understand what is going on there. So here shows the evolution of the emerging fox in the convective dynamo simulation. So the fox, the, this emerging fox is generated, generated locally in the convection zone, and it has a prograde flow of 100 meter per second, which is different from a classical scenario that if a flux tube is generated at the bottom of the convection zone and emerge uh, through the convection zone, it will have a radial rate flow in order to conserve the angular momentum. And earlier work shows that if a magnetic flux, if, if a flux tube with a radial rate flow will reach the surface and create a pair of sunspots, the leading spot will actually form later than the following spot, which is inconsistent with what observation shows. So this is a detour of the radial rate flow and progress flow. Then, so if we, if we ch so the emerge the, the the because the downdraft at the leading side of the at the leading side of this flux tube is stronger because the presence of the probe flow because the probe flow will bring more mass into the leading side and in order to get rid of its mass the downdraft then the downdraft at the leading side must be stronger to to, to remove the, the mass bring, brought by the probe flow so this creates a stronger downdraft at the leading side and then the flux tube is bent down by this strong downdraft at the leading height and makes a hairpin turn. Then this, uh, the upper part of the hair, hairpin flux tube emerges, will emerge at the flux tube with a stronger leading polarity. And when this flux tube reaches the photosphere, it creates a pair of sunspots where the leading polarity sunspot is stronger than the following polarity sunspot and most importantly it's also create it it's guaranteed that the leading polarity sunspot will form will form earlier than the following polarity spot which is consistent with observations. So in this experiment we try to extend the box from 100, 100 megameter wide to 200 megameter and we also try to extend the depth of the box from 8 megameter to 18 megameter. So this increases the density contrast of the box by a factor of about 6 when the original 8 megameter deep box has a density contrast of already more than 2000. So the, the, this new test confirms so what we find in the, in the experiment we showed just now, so that is a shallower one. It, it's including the, the leading polarity sunspot is stronger than the following polarity spot, and also the leading spot will form earlier, and also include that the leading spot is more close to the equator, which are the key features of the sunspot asymmetry. So, so uh, because we increase the depth of the box, so this gives us an opportunity to study the flow beneath the sunspot. Uh, here, I, this, these three panels show the vertical slice that is cut through through the center of the domain. So this is uh, this is x and y, and this is through a y slice. So this is a uh, x and z slice. So this panel shows the magnetic field strength, and this one shows the horizontal velocity of so the v x, and this one shows the vertical velocity in this slice, this is we that. Here blue is positive and red is negative. If we check the evolution of this, so at the beginning the magnetic field in this slice is mostly the mixed polarities field maintained by a small scale dynamo and here we see that the uh, flux concentration and the leading polarity start to form already in the convection zone and when it forms to the surface we start to see the pore corresponding to the leading polarity spot and later it grows to a sunspot. 
so far nothing has formed on the following polarity side. And then after, of, after some time, the, the following polarity start to form. And by this moment, the leading polarity field is still stronger than that. But the slide, because we simply put these slides in the center of the domain, this doesn't always cut through the center of some spot, unfortunately. So here I pick up two uh, characteristic times. So the first one is when t equals to 52 hours. That is when the leading polarity spot is about to fall. So we see that uh, because the vertical field at the leading polarity size is stronger, so the flux tube doesn't make a symmetrical shape as in earlier simulations. So it makes actually a very as asymmetric shape. It appears like a triangle with the leading polarity is much more vertical than that in the uh, following polarity. And we, if we check the horizontal velocity associated with the uh, magnetic flux tube, we see that uh, near the bottom there is the prograde flow, which is simply uh, heritage that flow imposed at the bottom boundary. And as the flux tube rises, rises to the surface, the rate of grade, uh, the prograde flow turns into a divergent flow because the, the, magnet, the flux tube must get rid of the mass it's carrying. So naturally, the, the mass will flow to both feet of the flux tube. And the second snapshot shows uh, T equals to 74 hours. So this is about uh, when the leading polarity field has, has formed at the sunspot. So it's interesting to check what is the flow beneath the sunspot. So we can see here, so this is, uh, this is a positive direction and this is mostly a negative direction. So that being close to the bottom, we have a, if we focus on, the, on this vertical flux tube, there is a convergent flow to the foot point of the flux tube that helps to hold its identity. Uh, and up close to the surface, this inflow turns to an outflow, which, is, which can be considered as the mode flow. So it's basically when the, when the supergranulation sees, sees the presence of this sunspot, it will flow so the outward just uh, along the edge of the vertical flux tube. And when this is observed at the photosphere, is, it is called a mode flow. Come on. And the other direction to extend this model is to extend its resolution. So in this case, we try to increase the resolution in all three dimensions by a factor of four. So that is a great increase in resolution. So this finally gives us a resolution of 48 kilometers horizontally and a, a 16 kilometer vertically. And with this resolution, we can resolve much more better the, the fan structures in the photosphere. So here you can see that the, the filamentary structure we see in the low resolution ground has been become much thinner. So these are very nice penumbra structures as observed in a real sound. And we also capture the process of flux emergence of, a, of the emergence of a small bipole here. We can see that the, the granulation cells are strongly distorted by the emergent horizontal flux. And if we check the velocity, if we check the vertical velocity of this flux emergence reading, we found that this emergent flux certainly associated, associated with uh, our flows and this so this panel shows the flow along magnetic field lines so the sign the definition of the sign that is a bit tricky but here we, we see a, we see a divergent flow that is that is associated with the emerging flux and around the sunspot so this is this are corresponding to the inflows which is different from the normal average average head flow we, we know because average flow is an outflow. But on the non-emergent side, we observe 
outflows at the vicinity of the sunspot. So if we check the evolution for, for a few hours, we see that so this is the uh, emergence of a small bipolar. So the granular, granular cells are strongly distorted by the emerging magnetic flux. So the granular cells appear to be very broad and large at the beginning, but then later they turned into thin filamentary structures like the penambras. And we also here we can see the persistent inflow into the sunspot uh, on this side and the development of the outflow on the at the, at the outer side of the active region, so to say. Cool. Yeah, this is a massive movie, so it's sometimes it's not so smooth to play it. So this brings to the end of the emergence of the mag magnetic flux to the surface, but we know that the magnetic field doesn't stop here, so it will further expand into the corona. And so the in the following, I will show the formation of the corona loops as a result of the magnetic flux emergence. So before we go to the flux emergence, we first uh, give a very, have a very brief introduction of corona loops. Because usually when we, when we talk about the, a structure in the corona, usually we are referring to corona loops. That is the main building blocks in the corona. So why they appear like loops? Because the plasma in the corona is highly conductive, so they are frozen in in magnetic field lines. And, uh, and well, the, the, the other point is that the magnetic energy is dominant over the plasma energy. So that means the plasma must follow the shape of the magnetic field line, not the, in the other direction. So this means the plasma is confined in the, mag in the arched magnetic structure. So we believe the magnetic field line arches about the solar surface like this, uh, connecting to some spot. And then the plasma are confined in it, so this UV loops. So this loop structure actually shows the shape of the magnetic field line. And this is the energetics of the corona loop. If so when the corona loops reach uh, equilibrium state, which means equilibrium and static state, which means the velocity and temporal derivative vanishes, Oops. we have this energy balance. So the L here is uh, energy loss through optically thin radiation, which is dependent on number density square and a function of temperature. And the, this term here describes the high anisotropic because it, uh, this is de describes the heat conduction is high anisotropic because it's predominantly along the magnetic field line, and it's very efficient because it has a very high dependence on the temperature, and because the temperature in the corona is so high, so this heat heat conduction is very efficient on um, transport the thermal energy along the magnetic field line. So what is still missing here is uh, the heating term. So when the heating is given by whatever form, then the energy loss and the heat conduction will adjust themselves to finally, to finally reach a balance. And when the balance is found, so it determines the density and temperature of this corona loop. So to say, the heat input or the heating in the corona loop finally determines the number density and temperature of this corona loop. So if we want to do a corona, realistic corona simulation, we must, uh, as, we said, as I said, we must include this key ingredient. So these two are relatively clear to implement, but the heating is still ha is a hypothesis. This is known as the corona heating problem. So what heat the corona? So one, one of the proposed mechanism is that the granular motion in the photosphere can break the foot point of the magnetic field line. 
and this will induce an upward pointing flux that brings magnetic energy from the photosphere into the corona, and the magnetic energy transported into the corona can be dissipated by ohmic dissipation and turns into the internal energy of corona plasma, so, so to say, it heats the corona. So one of the one of the so this idea has been tested was first tested by Gudiksen and Northern in a three relay six simulation and they proved that the energy uh, brought into the corona by magnetic field flying rating can successfully heat the corona to one million Kelvin and can generate uh, synthetic EUV observations that is consistent with actual observations. And so here is a model based on the same uh, model strategy. We can see how successful they are, even though it's not one-to-one -one comparable, but still they are, to my point, from my point of view, they are similar enough, and importantly, they are quantitatively similar, not only qualitatively. So what is the problem of the current, uh, I mean, the previous corona-realistic simulations? So that is, they, they usually use observed the magnetogram either from MDI or HMI, but but it's not it's not so straightforward to measure the velocity field from observation. So usually people use the artificial velocity that mimics the granular motion in the photosphere. So this loses the self consistent self consistentness of the velocity field in the magnetic field again, and also the Fox emergence process is never captured by all these models. So maybe you can guess what I'm going to do is to use a simulation to, to drive another simulation. So the simulation we use is a simula simulation of the active formation through Fox emergence. This is a realistic simulation done by Matthias and Mark Chun. So the good feature of this simulation is that it has very realistic Fox emergence process in the photosphere, and it can offer the velocity field and the magnetic field that are dynamically consistent. So, from this sense, the field flying braiding is no longer a hypothesis. Then it becomes a natural, it's naturally inc included in this model because we have both the realistic velocity and magnetic field, and they are fully health consistent. So, naturally, this velocity will braid with field flying. This is not really implemented is naturally included in this model. So, so here shows the evolution of the vertical magnetic field in this Fox emergence simulation. We can see that uh, two strong sunspots formed through the coalescent of small scale uh, magnetic features. So they move, the, so all this small stuff will move into the sunspot and intensify the, the sunspot. So this coalescent flow are pretty important in the following. So what we actually do is we take the temperature, density, velocity, and magnetic field, basically means everything, from the flux emergence simulation and put this data to the bottom boundary of a corona simulation. And this is again a time for a time dependent bottom boundary. So the corona simulation is driven by this boundary. In the corona simulation, we solve the fully compressible MT, which is certainly necessary for the corona. And we also include the, the key ingredient, so-called the corona energy balance we introduced just now. So the dissipation of the magnetic energy in this simulation is done by the ohmic dissipation, which means we implement a eta that suits for the resolution we have. And this eta will, yeah, will dissipate the magnetic energy and convert it into the internal energy of plasma. So for this simulation, we use the pencil code. So we have a great challenge in doing realistic chrono simulations because the time step determined by limited by the speed of heat conduction is extremely low. And also the outer speed in the corona is extremely high. So this gives us a time step limit of 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 4. And we want to involve this corona model for a few hours, which means the computation demand is tremendous. 
but we use the super time stepping and all feature splitting to treat the speed of heat conduction in, the, in this simulation. And also, I artificially limited the maximum often speed to be 2,000 kilometers per second, which is still one, more than one order of magnitude than this fastest sound speed in the corona simulation. So it means it maintains the low beta nature of the corona. And still, with all this treatment, the computation demand for this single simulation is 20 million core hours for two solar hours. I basically spent more than half of my PhD babysitting this simulation. So this is what we have from a lower resolution test case. So here we see that as the sunspot is forming in the photosphere, so this is implemented at the bottom boundary, So the, and we trace the same field line as time. So we can see the magnetic field line is expanding into the corona, and at the same time, their foot point are combined together to, to, into the sunspot due to the coalescent flow. So this gives the evolution of the magnetic field in the corona, but what we care more is if we can find corona loop. Indeed, we can. So this is the synthetic AIA, a synthetic EOA emission according to the AIA 193 channel. So you can see corona loop forms at different places and they form very fast within a few minutes, just like what we observed. Because this is a 3D simulation, so you have the freedom to rotate the box to choose whatever uh, point of view you like to check the appearance of the corona. So when we do the further analysis, we found that the the corona loop actually appear as mo almost a constant cross section, which is a very, this is a very important observation feature of the corona loop, and this is naturally reproduced in our simulation. And we, if we we choose the field line that is cons that is aligned with the spine of the EOA loop, we find that the foot point of this field line actually at the periphery of the Sunspot, and then so if we check the pointing flux, also the energy flux at the foot point of the corona loop. So the so this panel shows the vertical magnetic field, and this one shows the vertical, so the upward pointing flux, the positive uh, positive is upward, and the, the line here shows the same magnetic field line. So this is the foot point of the EUV corona loop. We found this sit right above a point where the outward point of flux is high. So that means the point of flux brings the energy into the corona, and then the heating, certainly the heating is essentially from the outward point of flux, because the heating, is, the heating is from the dissipation of magnetic energy, and this magnetic energy comes from this point of flux. And yeah, so that is what it says. So if we check the 3D view of the of the plasma structure in the corona, so this the, the, the red ISO surface shows the number density equals to 10 to the 9 per cubic centimeter, which is the typical density found in observations in the corona loop. And then the, the, the blue surface shows the temperature of 10 to the 5, uh, 10 to 5 Kelvin, which is the transition region. And the blue line shows magnetic field line. So here we see that the plasma are perfectly confined in this magnetic field structure, and it's indeed like a like a water water pipe, so to say. So if we check the temperature and the density along this magnetic field line, we find that it's right. It's just consistent with what we expected from earlier models. So the temperature increases steeply as the transition reading and almost flat through the corona because the heat conduction is so efficient, so there's almost no temperature perturbation here. And the number density is also quite flat at, uh, through the corona loop because the density scale height is so high at such high temperatures. So that means the temperature and number density are quantitatively consistent with observations meaning Kelvin-Tauss plasma 
dense, number density of 10 to the 9 per cubic centimeter. So that's guarantees we can get a UV emission that is consistent with a real observation because that is determined by temperature and density. So what is more important is that because we know that the heating actually sets the number density and temperature in the chrono loop, if we get the right thermal quantity here, that means we get the right heat input in the chrono loop, which is the most important point for chrono heating problem, which means we are doing right. So in the following, we want, uh, in the following what we do is to select a vertical slice through the center of the domain. So this gives us the cross-section of the chrono loop. And this shows the temperature and density on this cross-sectional plane. We don't find a chrono loop here. We only see some mushroom-type string-shaped string structure. But if we synthesize the AIE-193 channel emission, we found that the, the emission structure actually looks quite different from the temp Either the, temp either the temperature or the density because it's simply a convolution of both. So you can see here the, the green color roughly corresponds to the temperature range of this particular filter channel. And when this convolved with the number density squared, it gives us this more bright core. So, so bright here means dark area. The more bright core of this emission structure. And the basic nature of the chrono is that it's optically thin. So when you observe anything, you actually look through the line of sight. Or it's integrated along the line of sight. So if you integrate along, either you, you either see it from above or see it from uh, see it from side. So this gives the integration along each dimension, and so it's result a one D profile. So you can see this is a very Beautiful profile, as you can measure, you, as you can see from actual chrono loops. And the important thing here is that if you measure the full width of half maximum of this uh, loop cross section profile, it gives a width about two to four megameters. And if you still remember what the shape of the density and temperature structure, they are the, the, the typical width of about is about eight to ten megameters. So that means the emission could look very differently from the temperature and the density in the problem. So the remark is, is that so uh, the, the emission is determined of a certain channel, of a certain UV channel is determined by the density and the narrow temperature range. And then the emission could be very clumpy, even if the density and temperature structure are relatively smooth. And also the the, the density and temperature structure that's behind the emission you see can be very different from the emission structure itself. And the most important point is that you cannot get this from a Van loop model. So in the next, I, I would like to talk about the relation between the magnetic field line and the UV chrono loops. So, so we see this figure again because I said, well, the, this UV features outline the magnetic field loop, so why do we need to talk about it? So it's just like just like how we illustrate the shape of magnetic field in, in elementary schools by, by ion filling and magnet. So but this is only true for one single static snapshot like in this image. What will happen if the magnetic field line and the U and the plasma in the corona are both involving so this model gives us a good opportunity to check this because it has both the information of the magnetic field line and the information of the plasma. Here you see a side view of the synthetic AIE-193 emissions that is about the emission from 1.5 million Kelvin Tau's plasma. So there are two, two lines in this figure. The red line is the magnetic, so both of, the, both of them are magnetic field lines. The red line is the field line that we follow in time, so that means we follow its position in space. And the blue line is the line that we, that is the line with the spine of the UV loop in each snapshot. So that means the blue line in each snapshot are different lines. And the red line is always the same line. So if we check the evolution, we see the red line is emerging, emerging, emerging. So 
So here the following loop forms and the red line is aligned with the corner loop. But we know that the magnetic field line is emerging, is expanding upward as the red line goes. But the UV loop stays in the same place. So that means the field line moves through the UV loop. Also, it are decoupled in evolution. So the first thing people always ask me is, does your code actually follow the frozen in condition? Yes, it does. Because what is frozen in in the magnetic field line is the is the plasma. It's not the emission. Emission is only a convolution of plasma and the temperature. So let's first check what will happen if a uh, emergent loop takes some plasma with it. So at the beginning, the plasma is cold, so it is invisible in UV channels. And when this emerging loop takes the plasma and the plasma gets heated to over 1 million Kelvin, then it enters the temperature, the most sensitive temperature range of this channel. So this plasma loop will become a bright loop in the AIE-193 Im images. But if the heating continues, the temperature of the plasma will increase and finally leaves this temperature range of this particular channel. So what will happen is that this loop will get faint again in the image of this particular channel. So that means it's faint and bright and faint in the same plasma, the same magnetic field line. So that is exactly what happened here. So the, pl the field line, the plasma along this field line is cold at the beginning, and then they get heated and appear as a bright loop at this position. And then we, when it gets heated, furthermore, its temperature leaves, is simply too hot for this channel, and then it's invisible again. But at this moment, the other field line are heated to the right temperature, so they appear as a bright UV loop here. That is why they the evolution of the magnetic field line seems to be coupled from the evolution of the UV structure. So we only explained the phenomena so far, so what is the reason they evolve like this? So finally we must go to the heat input, or the heating of the corona, to answer this question. So we know that the heating of the corona comes from the energy flux from the photosphere, that is the pointing flux. So here again I show the vertical magnetic field line, uh, uh, vertical magnetic field strength and the upward, the vertical pointing flux where the, the, they are all positive. Yeah. So what we find here is that the higher, the, the high pointing flux seems to, to, to be a ring around the, uh, some spot, which is not so strange because in order to create a pointing flux, you must have the velocity doing work to the magnetic field line. And in the center of the sunspot, there's no, no fluid motion that can, can move the magnetic field line because the magnetic field is simply so strong. And at this uh, vicinity of the sunspot, even though the fluid can easily do work to the magnetic field line, but the magnetic field is simply too weak, so it cannot create a high pointing flux. Only at the edge of the sunspot, where, where you have relatively strong magnetic field and relatively strong fluid motion, so this creates the most strong upward pointing flux. And so we call this the hot spot at the edge of the sunspot. And what we do here is we select a, f a group of point which corresponds to the foot point of group of magnetic field line. And if we trace the evolution, what we found is that due to the coalescent flow into the forming sunspot, the foot point of these field lines moves all the way into the sun spot, but the range of the highest pointing flux stays at the same place. That means it moves through the highest, uh, uh, the highest pointing flux. Also, it moves through the place where they can get the strongest heating. So the point is that the point is that the heating stays at the same place, and magnetic field line continuously moves through it. So all the magnetic field lines simply follow the same evolution pattern. So that is what this figure shows us. So this is a sunspot, and the height of energy input always stays at the end of the sunspot. And the coalescent flow continuously push the magnetic field line into the sunspot, and meanwhile, the field line is emerging into the corona and it takes a cool plasma with it. And they get heated, get bright, 
and then they move away, but the following field line will get hit again here, and they get bright. So that means the field line always move up, up, uh, up uh, move upward and move inside the sound spot, but the bright UV structure always stays at relatively the same place. So that means if you check each of the snapshots, UV loops are nicely along its magnetic field line, which is true, which is consistent with the conventional view, but in such an emergent active, in such a case of flux emergence and forming active gradient, the evolution of UV loop can be very different from the evolution of magnetic field lines. So, so it's. So I will skip the conclusion. It's always nice to end the talk with a nice, cool movie. This is done with the chrome simulation. So the point is that by doing this realistic 3D simulation, it gives us the freedom to really go inside of the chrono where you can never go by prison. So that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. So questions? Yeah, so maybe I didn't quite understand exactly your mechanism for the loops emerging and then the field lines keep emerging but the heating stays in the same place. Yeah. So if I understand you correctly, it seems to me like um, as it emerges it should get warmer as it, as it moves up. Yeah. But if I look at AIA observations of an active region for instance, the hottest part, like in the 94 channel, mm -hmm. for instance, is tighter and lower down around the core of the active region, not not higher up. Well, that is not necessarily higher up. I mean, well, if you check the... If you check the height of this loop, it's like 10 to 15 megameters. And you, if you look at the active region now, yeah, it's easily much larger than than this. So, so finally, the the loop heated most in this simulation seems to be the loop that is connecting the the edge of this one sunspot to the edge of the other sunspot. So that is the inner edge of the active region. So, but so this is not inconsistent with what you say because this is likely to be this is likely to be the core of the active region. And and this part in the model is actually hotter than, than the part that is higher up or in the open field part. So so actually in this model we, we can call this part the core of the active region. Uh, the pointing flux is perpendicular to the magnetic field, but um, so you, you need yeah. a horizontal. Well, field. yeah, sure, you sure. The, well, this is only for the simplicity of the illustration. So, I so strictly speaking, you cannot have a pointing flux that is along the field line. Right? It's much perpendicular to the field line. So, what is really what what is What's producing the pointing flux? Is it the flow? This is the flow. So that means even though the field line is mostly straight, it's upwards. Let's take the most simple case. Then you have the the motion that is perpendicular to the field line is actually create a horizontal component, which is small compared to the vertical component. But this is the key to yeah. create a pointing flux that can go upward. <coughs> so first of all, I, I want to tell you that I think that this job is is really amazing. It's really impressive. Thank you. Um, I have, however, some comments and suggestions that they may look a little bit mean, yeah. but they are not. They are trying to improve slightly the, the presentation. So please go to the very first slide. So you see the, the, the environment of my three one. The, the first. Let's improve my question. Go to the second slide. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> exactly, you said first. <laughs> anyway, so I don't understand what you mean by Sony inversions. What do you mean by Sony inversions? Vector, vector magnetogram, Sony inversions. What do you mean? Oh, I, I guess you do the inversion of the stock's parameters. Right. So, so the, the, the magnetic field line, the line formation height is like, as we say, it's like tau equals one or a little bit above that. So that is where the, the stock's parameters are generated, so to say, because you want to measure, you measure the magnetic field line there. And then this stock's parameter will go through the relative transfer, and then you observe the photon on the ground. So from the photon, you observe, you want to get the, from the stock's parameter you measured at the ground, you want to get the stock's parameter as the place where the line is formed. I guess this is not exact, that they are not identical. What is not identical? That is why we use, like, people use spinner code to, to do the inversion. Yes, and? Yeah, so that is kind of inversion. And I know what is an inversion. I don't understand what you mean by shown inversion. I see, okay. So that means purely inversion. And what is the problem? Uh, not a problem. Yeah, it's, it's just in contrast to direct measurement. We directly measure the Stokes profiles. And then you invert the stock yes. profile at the line formation site. Exactly, we do. And? Okay, yeah. That is what I want to mean. Maybe I should change another expression. Or simply remove I mean, the conversion. I, I don't understand what, is you, what you find uh, weird. This is what I don't understand. What you find, what thing you find we are in an inversion of uh, Stokes parameters and recover the magnetic field from them. This is what I don't understand. I think that you find something weird on this process. No, that is not something weird. I mean, the, the, the idea is that you can you can directly measure something. Uh, say, so uh, well, on the other hand, what, what the only thing we can directly measure is simply photo. Yes, that, that's that's the base. <laughs> that is life. Yeah. That's that is what astronomy, astrophysics does. Measure. Yeah, so what ways. we can directly measure is simply the emission. It's okay. not the magnetic field, right? Okay. So my, my, my comments comes from you have done an amazing job making numerical simulations, but some of them there are observational values. Yeah. So for example, for the penumbra formation, there are papers by Slichenmayer or other people from Keys that I think it could be great if you can say here the inclination of the magnetic field is like that. And in the observation is like that. Uh, sure. Or, yeah. or for example, with teleoseismology, what is the values of the they have in the local area of the region in the convection zone? Yeah. So I think that could improve a little bit. Yeah, sure. I, I certainly know this observational works, and they are they are actually the reference of the model, right? We we don't always need to compare the model with with those actual observation because that is the reference. Yeah. Simply because. The limit of the content I can put in there, so I didn't include them explicitly here. Okay. Yeah. And one other thing in this slide, particularly, what I really miss, and I know the answer, but I guess I, I want to be mean with you. So did you? <laughs> don't take it personally. <laughs> did you just forget, forget, or just ignore the chromosphere? I just ignored it. I mean, okay. I, I, didn't that, get it. I knew the answer, but I want that you tell because it's a little bit. I mean, if I see that, uh, where is the chromosphere? We measure the chromosphere, we measure the magnetic field, we have a lot of data of the chromosphere. Yeah, just because I don't do the chromosphere in the simulation. I right? know, yeah. but it could be honest if you said there is no problem telling we are not able to reproduce the chromosphere. Sure. It's and more, I think it's fair and more honest to say that, that just is not ignoring. Yeah, I guess if you want to include include details of the chromosphere, you can do another talk. No, 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 no. I don't, no, 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 I'm not telling you. Yeah. What I'm telling you is, we can, you cannot in, uh, simulate this, the chromosphere. That's the point. And yeah. there is nothing wrong with that. Yeah, Will right. we arrive at that point in some years? Yeah. But, I mean, you cannot, <laughs> you are making a description of the sun and you, oops, boop, where is the chromosphere? Yeah, sure. If you want to include every layer, then you no, have no, 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 come on, don't go in this direction. Just say, no, we, uh, we ignore it because okay. we are not able. That's yeah, not a problem. Sure, sure. I think. Yeah. 
Okay. Do you have a quick question? Uh, that's not a question. I was actually going to save you both some trouble by offering a translation between the two. So, thank. Here's the thing. Alberto is doing inversions. There are a lot of people who do inversions, algorithm, who, who invent algorithms for inversions. And who, and yeah, so, so for him, to, to Alberto, some inversions is much like some plasma simulations. Uh, Alberto, when Feng says some inversions, uh, it actually means that uh, the exact mechanism is not exactly relevant for the point that he's making. For the what? For the point that he's making. So the point here is that you can mirror vector magnetogram on the photosphere. Sorry? So the point here is that you can have good observation of magnetogram on the photosphere. Not about the inversion. Oh, 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 come on. That's why, exactly why. Can you explain me why? Because you trust in your numerical simulations? Because you trust in a model? You are making assumptions in your, in your numerical simulations. Sure, sure. I, I, I'm saying. Saying, you saying the inversions. Sure. Saying. I'm not, telling, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not telling the inversions have the final solution and the, the final answer. Absolutely not. But as any other method. I yeah, mean, sure. you are taking yeah. uh, Reynolds numbers, but nobody believes on these things, right? So, <laughs> so what, what I want to say here is that not, if not, the measurement is not reliable due to there's uh, inversion of sort of called stock parameters. What I want to say here is that the photosphere is a place where we can have good measurement of magnetic line. So I, I, so that is what I also want to say. With the inversion, we can have very reliable. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, that is what I mean. You have very good measurement of magnetic field line in the whole field. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think in, in the interest of time, we'll stop there. Uh, <laughs> let's uh, thank, thank again. And, uh, yeah. Any other questions?